Welcome to the Long Thread Podcast about spinning, stitching, and weaving by hand. The podcast is presented by Long Thread Media, publishers of Spin Off, Handwoven, Piecework, and Little Looms magazines. Find us online at longthreadmedia.com. Trinway Silks is where weavers, spinners, knitters, and stitchers find the silk they love. Select from the largest variety of silk spinning fibers, silk yarn, and silk threads and ribbons at trinwaysilks.com. You'll discover a rainbow of colors thoughtfully hand dyed in Colorado. Love natural? Trinway's array of wild silks provide choices beyond white. If you love silk, you'll love Trinway Silks, where superior quality and customer service are guaranteed. At Stewart Heritage Farm in New Market, Tennessee, Farm to Fiber and Yarn has been part of their story for 20 years. Home to a small herd of alpacas, Stewart Heritage produces small batch roving, yarn, and finished goods in 100% alpaca and natural blends, in natural tones and brilliant hand-dyed colors. Discover the fine quality, long-lasting comfort, and soft luxury of alpaca to wear and enjoy in your home. Explore and shop alpaca at stuartheritagefarm.com. I'm your host, Long Thread Media co-founder, Ann Marrow. Macy Kaplan and Jen Simonic are the founders of the Loose Ends Project. Begun in 2022, the nonprofit matches the bereaved families of crafters with volunteers to finish special handwork projects that a loved one was unable to complete. So, Jen and Macy, thanks for being with me. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you so much. This is great. So, Jen, can you tell me about the Loose Ends Project and how it came to be? Sure thing. Uh, The Loose Ends Project is an organization that finishes projects left behind by crafters. Um, what will happen is a project owner will find something in their in their house and send us an email and ask us to finish it. And we will connect them with a finisher in their area near them that has the right skills. A lot of times um, people find projects that have been left behind. For example, grandma was making a quilt for someone and it needs some batting and backing. Um, and no one in family knows how to do it. So we're an organization that matches people with the skills with people with the projects. Um, And we make sure that that project goes back to the family that had the project, because that's an important part of the whole, um, the whole reason this works is because people want to do something good for somebody who's in grief or has lost somebody. We get a lot of weird requests to just finish projects that, you know, people are just bored with. That's not us. We don't do that. (laughs) We don't, we don't want to finish it and then just take it for ourselves. And, you know, we have enough stuff. So um, it's mostly about making sure that people who are grieving or are missing a loved one have this project back. So the way it got started is Macy and I have been thinking about ways to work together. And two summers ago in August, we met up with a group of friends that we usually meet up with once a year. And our friend Patty's mom had passed away and She came to us with the bag of stuff that you always get from a crafter uh, whose family doesn't craft. It's a bag that has all of their bits and pieces in it, all of their hooks, all their needles, all their stuff. And they give it, they give it to you because they know that you do this, this project. And the reality is, and your listeners know this, you normally don't want that stuff because you have enough of your own stuff. But it's important to take that bag and go through it anyway because uh, that's what we do. And it's and and by taking that bag, we're honoring that person who they love very much. Um, so as Macy and I were going through these things, sorting out the cotton to go to the senior center so they could make dish rags, to sorting out the fun fur that could go to a, a craft um, organization, the needles and the hooks, um, we came upon these two blankets that Patty's mom had been working on and. At she the two blankets were for her brothers. Now Patty has one a blanket from her mom, and I, I have actually slept under that blanket when I went to visit her. Which so I know how important that blanket is to Patty. Um, and we were going to see about finishing these projects for her, for her brothers. Now they were double crocheted all the way for I think I think each brother is over six five. So she tried wow. to do them like six five and then enough to fit over the person. Um, So they were big and they were going to be done. And I did not want to do that because I don't like to crochet. (laughs) I know how to, and I could totally have finished it, but it's not my jam. 
And my arm hurts thinking about it, actually. But Macy said, hey, you know that thing we've been thinking about, about finishing for other people? Maybe these two projects can be the start. And Patty was amenable to it because she was like, you know, that would be great. I know it's important to my mom to get these done. And Macy even had a name, Loose Ends, which is a lovely name. And then we took all this stuff back with us to our our homes and Macy made a website. We put some flyers together. I walked around and put the flyers up all over the place. Macy put them up. Uh, We were bad on the internet. Uh, We asked (laughs) any groups that we were not supposed to ask, like, hey, does anyone want to finish projects and people left behind? And some some places were like, yes. And some places were like, get out now. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But within a couple of months, we had, I I think two months, we had 150 finishers signed up all over the place, mostly in Maine and Seattle, because that's where we are. And we we had five projects. We had Patty's two blankets. We had, um, we had Annie's two sweaters and we had another Afghan, I believe. Right. Yeah, we made our friends help us in the beginning. So, yeah, the first four of the five were definitely like, for the pilot, um, just to test this out, they were friends. And and it went really well. I mean, the, the people who, who agreed to do them were were really touched by by the, the experience and they, they did a great job. And I mean, that, that's how it all started. That's so interesting because I, I had this idea in my mind that, you know, you, you finished one, th- that someone came to you and said, finish this, please. And then you t- took on two and then you realized that there, that, that it was just going to grow as a movement. And it seems like you actually were, were looking for a project where you could contribute. And this just happened to be something that fit in that mold. Is that right? Kind of how it started. Yeah, kind of. I mean, I, Jen and I had both completed projects for friends privately, like just mm-hmm. because of personal connections with people. And knowing what that felt like, like it just feels so good to do that. And it's so moving to be able to help a friend who's going through loss. And there was like, and I'm going to say a few years before Lucens actually launched there was an intention to make specifically this happen. Mm-hmm. We just didn't know what the timing was going to be like. I mean, the idea of finishing projects that people left behind is not a new one. We did not invent that. What we have invented is the idea of how to connect people who don't have a crafter ne- that they know nearby to finish the project. That's what we do. And I, I think in all the press that we've received, we, whenever you read the comments, which you're not supposed to do, <laughs> that's always been the comment. Well, I do this all the time. We're like, yes, people do do this. And that's a wonderful thing about crafting communities is that we finish each other's projects. The reality is, though, we don't always get leave good notes and our families don't always pay attention to when we talk and they don't always know what on earth we're doing. Mm-hmm. Right. So we're there for those families that might not have a crafter. And that's an excellent point. You know, the people that we all know as crafters know people who finish things, but being able to reach out to the people where there was somebody in their family who loved doing something, but there's nobody else in the family to to pass it on to. So being able to reach out and connect to the folks who are in need who don't even know that this is a possibility. Right. Yeah. And a lot of people have had projects Uh, The projects that we're getting sometimes are relatively new, but a lot of times they've been carried around from house to apartment to this city to that city because people know how special they are and they don't want to part with them, but they also don't know what to do with them, right? If no one's in your orbit, like certainly when I kick off, (laughs) (laughs) when I go, I have detailed notes for everybody. They're going to be at least a dozen projects people are going to have to do. Like I'm mm-hmm. part part of Loose Ends is born from this awareness of how important our projects are to us. And mm-hmm. and so it could be that there's a very crafty group of crocheters, but the person who passed away in the family was a knitter or a weaver. A lot of times it's rug makers, you know, um, it could be someone who just didn't do the same craft. Like it could be that mm-hmm. the friends and family of a person who passed away are, are crafty people. It's just a different skill involved. So 
that's where we're able to help too. Yeah. And we finished, our finishers have submitted some projects too. Like we have right. people who are finishing other people's knitting, but they don't know what to do with the quilt that grandma left. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Among my friends, we joked about having a craft executor. Yeah. It's a good idea. Yeah. I've heard of that. That's a real thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah, for I, your My staff. husband knows whom to call. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's super important because, you know, as I'm getting older and, and have older parents and trying to figure out what to do with their stuff, it's important to, to have a plan for, for your stuff so that it doesn't just get thrown in a landfill or, I mean, some of it can probably get thrown in a landfill. <laughs> I'd probably should put notes on the stuff that can be thrown in the landfill. But, but you know, how, why not make it easier for people to discern what's really important and what meant a lot? And now a word from our sponsors. Brown Sheep Company is a four-generation family business bringing you high-quality wool and natural fiber yarns. We spin and dye U.S.-grown wool into hundreds of vibrant colors at our mill in western Nebraska. Our mill has something to offer for every craft, from well-known knitting and crochet yarns to wool roving for spinning and felting. We offer U.S.-made needlepoint yarns as well as yarn on cones for weaving. Learn more about our company and products at brownsheep.com. Knitpicks.com has been serving the knitting community for over 20 years and believes knitting is for everyone, which is why they work hard to make knitting accessible, affordable, and approachable. Knitpicks responsibly sources its fiber to create an extensive selection of affordable yarns like High Desert from Shanico Wool Company. Are you looking for an ethical, eco-friendly yarn to try? Look no further than Knitpicks Eco Yarn Line. Need needles? Knitpicks makes a selection for knitters right at their Vancouver, Washington headquarters. Knitpicks.com, a place for every knitter. And now back to the show. So you sort of hinted at the variety of crafts that you have finishers in or have projects in, but Macy, can you tell me about the scope of the, of the projects that people have have either asked you, can I finish something in this or can you finish something in this? Yes. When we started Loose Ends under two years ago, we did not expect it to grow so fast. We started out with just knitting, crochet, and quilting. And like Jen mentioned earlier, within a couple of months, there were maybe 150 projects and I mean, 150 finishers and five projects. We're now home to more than 25,000 finishers from 64 different countries, everywhere in the US, all over Canada and beyond. So in that sense, we've grown very quickly. We have maybe between 2,000 and 2,500 ish projects going. So there is, a, you know, there's a disparity there. There are a lot of finishers who are waiting for something to do, but that's okay. And we have also expanded from just being knit, crochet, and quilt to really embracing any kind of textile. So rug making, weaving, needlepoint, cross stitch, embroidery. You name it, if it's made with string, we're wheel. And we, ha- Jen and I have had to learn what some of the things even are that I, I'd never even heard of before. And one of the beautiful parts about having so many people from so many places is that if there is a craft that's really specialized, like bunka, for instance, or nail binding, or there have been other ones too, where we're just like, I don't know if, this, if we have somebody for this, but we always seem to like somewhere. Sometimes we do try to match people who are local to each other, but sometimes with those um, sort of specialized, rarer crafts, a project will have to travel by mail to its finisher, but it has grown to really embrace really any textile. What is bunka? I feel like I should know. <laughs> Google. It. It's um, it's <laughs> Japanese thread painting. It's embroidery. Oh, okay, cool. And even the Japanese speakers I know, they're like, that means craft. I'm like, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> but there was an American Bunka Association. It, it's the point now, but I think the pandemic took it out, which is sad because of all things, you shouldn't have been able to embroider at home mm-hmm. during the pandemic. But there are people who do it and they, it, they're really beautiful. It, it, some beautiful images get created from it. So- 2,500 projects seems like a ton. Jen, I see a whiteboard behind you. And that's, <laughs> is that, that can't be how you organize them all. No, that's how I try to keep organized. We actually have 
in December of that year, once we started doing this, we did a little bit of press. Somebody I knew had a knew the weekend anchor at the local TV spot. So they did a little spot on us and it made it look like I just sit there all day knitting, which is not what I what I was doing. But it got it generated some more interest and was that that point we got about five hundred finishers and maybe twenty projects. And when that happens, uh, my neighbor who is in tech went to bed and told his wife that he was not doing anything for Jen. Now, Jen did not ask <laughs> for anything. <laughs> to be completely clear, we were fine with our spreadsheet. Um, we thought that was fine. Um, but I don't know if you've had a spreadsheet with 17,000 rows in it. It's okay. not ideal. And we were not fine. And a couple of days after he had made that proclamation, he came over and said, this is what I envision. This is what I think. <laughs> So in his spare time, this person with a full-time job and family and, and educations to pay for, put together a, a web app, which confuses people because it's not on your phone. It's just a, a web app. And it helps intake all the finishers. And with this web app, app, we're able to go in, take an address where a project belongs and use the mapping function to say, you know, find me all of the finishers near this project to can crochet. And then it'll pop up the map. It'll show us the self-proclaimed expert, intermediate and beginner skilled person that are nearby. And we match them that way. When someone offers to be a finisher, we ask them a, a bunch of questions like, what are you good at? What do you, what do you want to do? Do you want to finish blankets? Do you want to finish sweaters? What's your, what's your favorite thing to finish? We also ask them, what do you never want to do again? You know, some popular choices there are, I never want to knit black yarn again. I don't want to do paper piecing. And and what's funny is paper piece, quilt piecing is other people's like total jam. That's exactly what they want to do. And that's great. So the idea is not to torture our volunteers with projects that they do not enjoy. The idea is to match somebody based on location, skill, and druthers. Like, do you know how to do it? Are you nearby? And do you want to? Because if you want to do it, you're going to finish it. And if you're nearby, you've made a, you're making more community, which is the, uh, the quiet part about our project is that there are people all around that want to help um, and they might not know how to do it, how to reach out to help. And um, what we do is just put those people together. So I love the idea that you have not only do you have more finishers than projects, but, you know, Jen's neighbor was so attracted by the idea of being part of this that he overcame that. <laughs> it, it seems like people really are, are drawn to this and really want to be part of it. Are, are you finding that people are just, I want to sign up for this? We have found that people are enthusiastic about signing up. And on the one hand, we were blown away by how many people have signed up in such a short period of time. But we are not surprised that the crafting community wants to connect and be generous in that way. Because if you look at how many crafting opportunities that there are for charity or for, you know, community connection, there are lots. And a lot of the people who are volunteers with Loose Ends are also have been volunteering for their local hospital, you know, or for their local shelters or for other nonprofits or um, for their school or make things for, you know, and we see a lot of people who say, they, why did you want to sign up? I wanted to sign up because everybody I know already has enough stuff from me, right? Or like we like to make things for people. It's how we express love, right? One of the ways like cooking or like doing anything for somebody with your hands. So, and and the other kind of cool thing is, so two years ago, we were still kind of spinning off the end of COVID times, right? And um, people were just starting to emerge from really being isolated from each other and really were craving that kind of community connection and being around other people again. So Loose Ends does kind of offer a it offered a safe way to do that. You know, you could have this kind of experience with a stranger or who would maybe become a friend or was somebody around you. 
but in a in a way that if you you were just going to still be working on it in your own time in your own house, right? So it also offers a great opportunity for introverts to volunteer. Certainly not everybody's an introvert at all at loose ends, uh, but it is a way that you can, if you don't want to, you know, go have to do a big training or go, uh, um, you know, spend a long time or spend a whole weekend with a lot of other people. It's a way you can actually just do your favorite quiet craft in your own time, in your own space, and still be able to experience what it feels like to give to somebody else in that way. It does remind me that, you know, there was the people, please stop knitting sweaters for penguins. The penguins really don't need sweaters because people were so (laughs) eager. I want to feel like I'm helping. I want to do something. I want to help the penguins. What are you telling me? (laughs) uh, Yeah, we want, we all want to, we already all want to, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, that enthusiasm kind of shines through in our finishers because we have a finisher group and there, there's always a nice shiny person who shines up and is like, and who shows up and is like, I want my new project. And then not, I mean, we have projects. There's probably one project for every 20 people. And there are people who nicely tell them, oh, you're going to have to wait a little bit. And then there's people who tell them in not so nice ways, like, you know, someone has to die for that to happen. And, and, and both of those things can be true. You can be excited because you're going to help somebody and you, you know, you can acknowledge that this is grief, but, but I like to think of it as like, we're, if you get an opportunity to finish one of these crafts, it's kind of like being able to perform CPR one day, right? Like I want everybody to know how to do CPR. I don't want everyone to have to perform it. Um, but I like to know that there's people out there willing to finish things when somebody's left something behind. I'm mixing my metaphors, but you get what I'm saying. Right? Okay, it's working saying. though. Yeah. Yeah. And so whenever somebody says, well, you've got that many finishers, why would you need more? We always need more because, you know, n- not everybody's available all the time. And if you are, are interested in helping us and you sign up, great. We would, we, we want all those people to be ready and able. Um, we'd love more projects too. Uh, and, and I gotta believe there's millions of projects shoved in closets that people just don't have an identified or have given up on finding someone to help. So. Well, particularly if you're thinking about having a regional focus and, and it, it sounds like sometimes there's, you know, a, a connection, not only a pick up and drop off kind of a connection between the finisher and the family, but, but people, you know, people are pouring their hearts into it. And so there can be a little bit more of a bond there. So if everybody is in Maine and Seattle that, you know, you, you want to have a geographic dispersion of, of right. finishers. Yeah. Yeah. And there are definitely more um, people in in certain places than others. There are a lot of projects come in from everywhere, even remote places, little islands here and there. Like we, So the more people who sign up, the more likely we are able to match people who will be able to get to know each other. Because otherwise, things do need to go by mail. And it can be a little bit anxiety provoking to have to put this piece of important uh, material into the mail system. So we try to focus locally first. So you mentioned that there's a finishers network, Jen, and are there newsletters? Is this a community that people find other crafters among the finishers? Uh, we do have a newsletter and we love anybody who, who wants to be in it to be, to be on our mailing list. We have a Facebook group um, of finishers that have about 10,000 finishers now, Macy. Yeah, it, it, we passed the 10,000 mark. It's private. It's just for people who have signed up actually as finishers and are confirmed finishers. Not not people with projects already necessarily, but people who have said that have signed up. Yeah, it's a, it's a great place. We have a we have an admin and we and she tells people how many people are, are in the group and People are always like, oh, you must be really busy. And she's like, actually, they're really well behaved. Everybody's there for like really good reasons. Um, And it's not that they're a monolith. They are very different people. 
and they are opinionated about craft, which is lovely. Lovely. That is day. true. That is a hundred percent true. It's so funny. It's a place where people can, while they're waiting for a project to do, not everybody in there has been matched with something yet, but it's a place that people can still um, connect and help uh, now. You know, they can help us. I mean, I just posted a quilt up there this morning. It's a place where Jen and I can, and Sarita could put a project up that is confusing to us. You know, either it, maybe it doesn't have, maybe it wasn't left behind with a pattern or maybe it wasn't left behind with any of the materials needed to finish it. And we can ask those questions. Has anyone seen this? You know, here's a panel of part of a sweater. Does anyone recognize this? And they always do. They always, always figure it out for us. It's pretty amazing. The the brains in the room, people will help us source materials or vintage or hard to find yarns. We can ask people, what is this craft? I've never seen this before. Like, is this, you know, this was, and not everybody who submits a project knows what it is. And they may say, this is knitted, or this is needlepoint, or this is cross stitch, but it might not be. And so if we think maybe it might not be, we can put a picture of it up and say, what is this craft? And, you know, get the whole group in on it. Super helpful. They're amazing. That's how I figured out what Tunisian crochet was because I p- posted something and I was like, hey, this looks like knitting and people are saying it's not. What is it? And, <laughs> you know, then I got five responses saying it's, oh, it's Tunisian crochet or Afghan pattern. And uh, you use this with it. And here's five YouTube videos. Like they, they just, they bring it, which is bring it. awesome. Yeah. Oh, and that other one, Jen, with the parallel. Um, Hairpin lace. Yeah. Oh, Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. So much hairpin lace. Mm -hmm. And my favorite, like, we had an interaction where we put up something and we're like, hey, does anyone recognize this? I think it's crochet. Not sure of the pattern. And within 20 minutes, people are like, it is crochet. It's It's a pattern that I've seen before. And then an hour, oh, I saw that in this magazine that it's from 1935 that I think I have in a closet somewhere. (laughs) And then... Ah, forget. I'll just write it out for you. And you're like, okay, (laughs) awesome. That's that's great. I mean, just the amount of skill. And when in the beginning, we didn't have so many people. So we were like, could you try and finish it? We don't have to do that anymore. Now it's like, hey, we have this. Do you have this skill? And you'll never be matched with something that you you can't do. Because you're going to tell us, no, mm -mm, I can't do that. No, I can't do that. And, you know, we've had situations where someone's taken on something and then they become infirmed. So, like, I have not seen so many pictures of broken arms ever. Like, the the people, sometimes they'll be like, I, I did this. I had my cast on, but I'm sure I can finish it. We're like, no, we'll find <laughs> someone else. It'll be okay. We're, you're going to, yeah, and it just adds to that story. Now this person had the original finisher. They they had the, the original crafter and now so many hands have gone to making this this work um it's not it doesn't happen all the time but when it does happen it's not life happens and that's how we got these projects so sometimes you know life happens but it's been a really uh wonderful confirmation of human decency and kindness that it just uh it's just a special thing to to see so a lot of our listeners are weavers, and I have to say that one of my questions has been, you know, knitting, crochet, you can you can pass along a pair of needles or a, or a hook. What do, what do you do with weaving projects? Yeah. <laughs> I've done a bunch of those. Yeah. So that's a great question because, right, it, it, that weaving projects come with big tools that take up lots of space. There aren't as many weavers around as there are people who do crochet and other in knitting and stuff. But we have, let me, while I answer your question, I'm going to just peek and tell you how many weavers have signed up. And while you're doing that, I can think of two projects that we've had. There's the one in the UK and then there's the big one in Alaska that just got. Well, and I was also think of the talent that that just um, got finished. Um, yeah. That had to be restrung, and all your gosh. weavers out there know how hard that is. Oh my gosh! Um, but they did it. Yeah, you're right. That was we have a, just about 900 weavers who have signed up. 
So one really cool weaving story is that a woman in the UK submitted three rugs that were all three on looms and they had belonged to her deceased sister, uh, who was not only an accomplished weaver, but she liked to rebuild looms and would take things apart and kind of build things and fix things. And she had a special blog where she chronicled her journey of rebuilding some kind of special loom that she was working on. And when her sister submitted the project, we were able to match, find a weaver who was like within an hour. And so when we made that connection and introduced them through email, they started to, the two folks started to write to each other and discovered that the person who we chose to be the finisher had been following her sister's story and also like rebuilding a loom like side by side and had been home waiting for the next lesson, like waiting for the next installment to come. And so didn't know that she had passed away. And so making that kind of connection happen just had this whole extra layer of special to it. It took a while, but they actually had a big box truck come take all three looms. The finisher made an um, arrangement with a local museum that's letting her have a room in the museum where she can put all three looms and work on them. Um, I think there's like a day or two days a week that she goes in and just weaves to finish these. But talk about like a community effort. I just think that that is the coolest story. We got pictures along the way of like the guys moving the looms onto the truck. And it was just really, it was pretty, it's not done it yet, was right? pretty groovy. No, no. In fact, not only that, but I mean, it seemed like it was from a while ago, but it's only just over this past winter even got moved over to the museum. So we, Jenna and I spoke with the Alaska Weaving Guild at some point last year as well, which was great. And then we had a um, another weaving project to get submitted from Alaska and we couldn't find somebody to finish it right away just from our app. And so I was able to reach back out to the guild and just say, hey, is there, a, could you help us? Could you just help us? And they did. And they, you know, like by, by the next day, there were, I had a bunch of emails from people saying yes. The we so the weaving projects are less kind of like you know we we can't as easily make these like quick connections happen. So far, at least in my experience, Jen, the three biggies that I've worked with have required a like a, a lot of logistics and stuff. <laughs> They're important and worth it, you know, really worth it because yeah. I mean, how many finishers did that talent have? Like, you had the people to restring the loom, right? Well, and then originally, you had the people to tie. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Originally, there were going to be like three to five different parties that were going to take part of this talent and fix, you know, finish it. And um, there's a special way, and I'm not familiar with all of the special ways, but there were, again, we didn't have to know that we have this wealth of smart finishers around who did know. Um, but there were teams of people who were gonna, I'm going to do this and I'm going to pass it on to them. And then they're going to do this part and pass it on to them. And then they're going to do the ta- the um, tassels. And um, what happened is the fir- it got kind of caught up in the first bit where it was just really too much work for this finisher to completely restring an entire room. And so she just was like, I can't do it actually. So wound up again. So we just, um, the blessing of time, right? Like that was almost, a, it was a long time ago. And just in this time, like the person has shown up who was like, I'll do it. She took it. She restrung the entire thing. She sent us pictures all along the way of all the weights hanging down on her warp threads in the back. Every single one <laughs> a lot. with its picky little, um, not, you know, and it was just a masterpiece. Like it really was amazing. And she did a beautiful job with pictures too. Like every single time we would just be like, what? Wow. We, I, we, I, I got to ride 
shotgun on it, just <laughs> looking at yeah. the pictures. Every once in a while, I get another email like, oh my God, I, know. I can't believe I, that happened. I just brought you in so you could see these. Because we have to, we have to divide awesome. and conquer. Like we each have at least 300. Each of the three of us each have at least 300 or so projects going at a time. So we have to just focus on our Easily. own. But every so often there's something just so like you all have to see what's happening over here. And I'll just pull it. We'll pull each other in and for the show. Yeah. I just had a project where somebody submitted a blanket that uh, like a a blanket that was knit by a great grandmother that had some scissors taken to it Ooh. and it had gotten undone and it was a mess. And I posted it on the finisher group and said, Hey, should Kent, do you think, what do you think? And there were a lot of like, <laughs> Nope, no. And then there was this one woman who was like, of, of course we can fix that. I was like, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> and she's like, ah, yeah, totally. And she, she did it. Like, she totally did it. And she re I mean, it's, it is not exactly how it was, but it's darn near close. It's like, pretty it's great. pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. I did. did I, and and you, you, sh- you showed me that. And you're like, what do you think? Is this even possible to fix? And I'm like, no way. Like, I can't imagine <laughs> no. a world where that can get fixed. Like, that's so beyond. I mean, it's just a blanket with like, it. And not only holes in it. Like, how did she mm-hmm. even do that? Yeah. I don't even. And not only did she do it, she did it in like a week. <laughs> like, she was like, I am on it. I got this. And. Like she, like I got these pictures. I would get pictures every day, and I was like, "She, she took stitch holders and she put it all around." Like it was, it was amazing. I sorcery. like these people are amazing. That was pure sorcery. Yeah, and and the the fun part about this is, if you ask us how many projects we've had finished, we have no idea. And it's not because we can't count. It's because these people, like, we get a finisher who gets a bag, right? And they're like. This is a baby blanket that needs to be finished. And the finisher will make the baby blanket and will say, oh, wonderful. So you made a baby blanket. And they'll say, yeah, but there was extra thread. So I made a baby sweater and a doll and another hat and some booties. Uh, you know, because, you know, that's what yeah. we had enough for that. Or the guy who did, we gave a quilt to finish and it turned out to be eight lap quilts and he finished them all. We only expect you to finish the project we give you. We don't really expect you to do more because it's already a lot to do the one. But the fact that these, I mean, this is just who these finishers are, right? They're they're giving, caring, generous people that are like, nope, this needs to be done and I'm going to do it. So yeah. I'm, just, I'm constantly amazed yeah. at their generous and we don't always, we often don't even know until the end. So Obviously, we wouldn't match somebody with three blankets at once, but we will hear, uh, like, we we check in for updates every couple of months. Like, we let people work on their own time. There's never a deadline, but we do these check-ins. And I I checked in recently to somebody and heard, yeah, I'm actually finished with the first blanket and I'm still halfway through the second blanket. I'm like, the second blanket? What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you were only given one. We did not know. How did that? Two. Okay. So, yeah. You know, that's interesting. Cause Jen, the, the example you were talking about with the blanket that was cut up, it, it makes me realize that there's a certain amount of like, you know, vent, craft ventriloquism where not only are you finishing this thing, but you're sort of trying to be in the hands of this other, other crafter and there must be times when people are having to try to make decisions like, here's how I would do it, but here's how I think they would do it. Do you hear back from people who are trying to make those decisions or is it something that they sort of interpret on their own? Oh, no. They, they Well, we, we tell them that communication is key and we tell them we want updates. And sometimes they'll come to us and say, what should I do? And we'll say, well, let's talk to the, let's talk to the project owner and come up with a plan. Like we had a we had this beautiful sweater that was being made that that had tulips all over. It was in Tarja. And it was going to be this great sweater from the 80s. And 
they talked about it and it was like, you know what? That panel is beautiful. How about we turn it into a baby blanket? And that, you know, there's a lot of MacGyvering kind of stuff. Like, yeah, you can finish this this shirt that was being made for the two-year-old who is now 40, who has no children. What, what would be a better thing to make for them? Um, and sometimes it's, you know, make something that can be framed or we try to have those people talk to each other. And uh, I mean, we match people. So the idea is we match them and then they go with the relationship and talk to people. But there are times when the, the I like how you said craft and troublequism. You're trying to figure out what, what was the plan. Yeah. And if the plan was to do something, is it still a good plan? Like there's a lot of times that crafters make stuff that, you know, it's shoved in the bottom of a drawer because perhaps maybe they, the pattern was funky. Yeah. Maybe they gave up. Like we, we, we are curious sometimes about that. Like maybe it didn't get finished because Mm. (laughs) right. It got hard. It, something yeah. wrong but we don't it know. got hard it got it it didn't make sense i mean i have a a crocheted bikini top that <laughs> should never be finished 